This video is sponsored by Squarespace. Follow the link in the description to start your website journey today. In the previous video, I took Qatar Airways' renowned Q Suites from Montreal to here in Doha. In this one, we'll continue my journey home to Riyadh and check out some of the accommodations and attractions while we're here in Hamad International. Today's journey is a relatively short one, and nonetheless, we'll be flying on a 777-300 around the Gulf of Bahrain and across the eastern province into the Saudi capital and my family's home, Riyadh. A flight time of only 58 minutes over some 410 miles. But before that flight takes off, I have a whole 21 hours to kill. Due to border restrictions, I'm not actually allowed into Qatar. But that's not really a problem, since the airport itself is quite the destination. And so, we pick up the action right after I alight from my last plane. Okay, it's 21 hours until my next flight. There is a really nice lounge here, but that's not where I'm headed. Instead, I'm going to the transit hotel, where I intend to take a hot shower and then sleep. What, why am I not on that thing? Ugh, oh, stupid. Now, I've never actually been inside the new Hamad International Airport, at least not during the day. And can I just say, this is maybe the most beautiful interior to any airport I've ever come across. The rosy wood and aluminium amalgam just does it for me. The architecture is somehow imposing, yet still manages to foster a sense of serenity. I know this is COVID and all, but it was so pleasant how quiet and relaxing the terminal was. It's almost as if you've been taken away from the real world and put into a- Oh. So much for that. On the subject of things that were rather jarring, the airport also has a collection of rather macabre art installations. Have a look. If you define art as something that is meant to get people talking, then I guess you can vaguely consider that to be part of it. I don't know. I'm tired. Frankly, don't care. Let's go find this hotel. The hotel I booked is called the Oryx. It's the only proper hotel airside, and you get a heavy discount if you're on a long layover with Qatar. There is another capsule hotel, but that one doesn't even come with bathrooms. Oh my god. I have to stir that stupid bear from here. Since I was going to be here for a little while longer, let me give you a rundown of the hotel. As far as transit hotels go, this place is pretty... Halaziz kef halik. Let, 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 listen, listen, are you listening? Transit hotel. Like, Yanni, I can't leave the airport. I don't have a visa. Uh, I gotta go. Can I call you back in a little bit? Okay. Okay, okay. Yalla, bye. Bye-bye. What was I saying? As far as transit hotels go, this place is pretty nice. I mean, has a pool. The pool's not open. Okay, so the pool might not be open right now, but I mean, it still has one. And it's got all the other essentials of a transit hotel as well. You can close the door so with the lights turned off, it's pitch dark in here. It's also dead silent. The soundproofing is fantastic. Uh, the bed is comfortable. The pillows are nice. You've got hot water, tea, coffee, a spacious and clean bathroom. Really all you need for a transit hotel. With all of that said, it is still an airport transit hotel and for 350 US dollars a night, you can stay somewhere very nice in town. So it's meant strictly for people who can't or don't want to leave the airport. In fact, they won't let you book for longer than one night as per the airport's 24 hour maximum transit policy. The hotel is owned by Qatar Airways though and with that, the staff downstairs will know your passenger information, your boarding times and all that stuff. So they'll know when to call you and contact you in case anything changes and where to find you in case you're not your gate when it's time to board. Um, there is a room service and spa menu, but 
Obviously, you have to pay for these, which is not the case at the business class lounge downstairs, which is where I intend to spend the rest of the day eating. So I'm gonna clean up now, I think, pack up and check out. Before we go, there is one thing I have to show you, which is crazy. Um, it's this window and this window through which you can see people <laughs> in what I believe is a lounge down there. I'm not sure which lounge it is, but oh my God, it's an absolute invasion of everyone's privacy. <laughs> Who's gonna look <laughs> Who designed this? Man, that bear is weird. It's like the botched creation of someone who doesn't know how to turn on no clip and CAD software. Ugh. All right, so I know that some of you nerds are gonna go in the comments right now and smash out a paragraph about this bear. So let me just be the first to say that yes, I know a Qatari princess bought this and yes, I know that it was over five million pounds. And I'm also aware of the fact that she couldn't put it anywhere else so it ended up being in here. And lastly, no, I did know until five minutes ago when I looked this up that it is rather disturbingly not the only one of its kind in existence. Now that we have that out of the way, let's move on to the lounge, which you can probably tell from the buildup of the music is quite a special place. This is Qatar's flagship Al Marjan Business Class Lounge which features not one, but two full-service restaurants. On top of the cornucopian buffet spread, there's also an a la carte menu, available 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Did I mention there's sushi and an extensive wine list? All of this is included with a mission, by the way. And that's just for food. There's so much packed into this vast space, I couldn't possibly cover them all in this video. It'll end up twice as long. Hence, I made a separate upload going over this truly magical place, so look out for that if you want a more detailed overview. But allow me to end by saying that this is only the flagship business lounge. There is in fact a first class lounge that blows even this place out of the water. Unfortunately, I didn't get to check it out on this trip, but my friend Paul did. I've linked his video if you want to completely shatter what your expectations are for airline hospitality. All right, off to Riyadh, finally. C5, Charlie 5. Is that George Clooney? Huh. They have iMac public workstations. Wow. Having spent the better part of a day in this airport, I was thoroughly impressed with just how many things there are to do here. Had I not been eager to see my parents at the time, I wouldn't have minded staying a little bit longer. Just talked to the guy. There is a corral for the Riyadh flight. I don't have to go in right now, but uh, thankfully there's no secondary security check. That would have taken forever for me, but there is a secondary visa check. Um, but it doesn't look too busy right now. I might go through there like either now or later. This is pretty standard for countries with heightened security, like the US, UK, Saudi Arabia, North Korea, you know, those kind of countries. Our flight to Riyadh today will be served by this 300ER variant of A777. I didn't catch the registration, but Qatar's entire fleet of these are beginning to age a little bit. This one, however, is fitted with Q-Suites, which the airline brands as first class on these short haul routes. I went inside the corral at the announced time of boarding, having seemingly forgotten that time works differently in the Middle East, where the universally observed tardiness meant we wouldn't get on the plane for another 15 minutes. 15 minutes, which we can spend talking about this video sponsor, Squarespace. I'm just kidding, we're not gonna spend 15 minutes. What I'm not joking about though is having an internet presence, which is perhaps more consequential now than ever. Some of you may know that I ran a college hustle making websites on Squarespace. I chose the platform because it offered comprehensive solutions to the small businesses I helped, 
Whether you're selling services, products, or simply yourself in the form of an online portfolio, Squarespace takes away the need to hassle over payment APIs, online store integrations, or connecting an email. Simply choose from one of over 100 website templates or build your own from scratch. These days, if you can set up a Tinder profile, then you can build a website with Squarespace. It's that easy. Follow my link in the description for an extended trial, and when you're ready to publish, use the coupon code on the screen for 10% off your first purchase. Boarding was pretty straightforward. Two jet bridges with strict enforcement of boarding zones, first class and families first. Damn, I wish that was that cool when I was a kid. This was my seat, well, at least at first, on this one-hour flight, a backwards-facing window arrangement. There's not too much of a difference in this product between the A350s and 777s, with the disparity in cabin width exercised in the aisles rather than the suites. My neighboring seats 6B and its starboard side equivalent would have to be the worst addresses on this plane, not only are the seats further from the window, you only get about 5 8 of one. Overall though, Q-Suite still represents one of the best utilizations of space in an airplane cabin. The high level of privacy and personal volume is nearly unrivaled in the business class category. Taking a look at the suite, the 777's is almost identical to the A350's, so I won't go into too much detail. However, I will point out that the IFE remote here is the ubiquitous Panasonic handset, and not an Android one. And over here, on top of all the other I.O., there's also an HDMI input, allowing you to take over the screen. And speaking of the screen, this one doesn't have any buttons on the bottom, unlike on the Airbus. Apart from those, I didn't really notice any other differences between the 777 and the A350. On these shorter flights, headphones were available only by request, as were the water bottles. Impressively, or maybe not for the world's self-proclaimed best airline, there was still a printed menu for the short hop. As you probably can tell if you read the menu, this was a dry flight, so everything was halal, including this non-alcoholic imitation rosé. This is quite interesting. It's not what you would expect from what it looks like, but I mean, it's good. It tastes kind of like Barbie can, if you know what that tastes like. I think it might just be Barbie can, actually. Oh. Having unwittingly vandalized my seat, I had to think on my feet. It soon occurred to me that it was probably easier just to use my feet, to run away, to a new seat. This one, in particular 8A, which, on top of being almost identical to my previous seat, has the added bonus of being home to some pretty decent engine views. This rear business cabin also turned out to be a pretty decent hideout. There was no one else here, hence no one to rat on me. All I had to do now was bide my time.
despite being a rather short one, this flight ended up being very scenic. Word of advice for departures out of Doha, sit on the left side. Once in the air, I discovered that the technology on this flight was slightly antiquated. For example, this was the full extent of the route map, a static carousel of views with no interactivity. Kinda like the early 2000s. The Wi-Fi was worse, in the sense that it was non-existent. That is, unless it was provided through Badra's iPhone. In which case, to this day, I still don't know who Badra is, and more importantly, what her passcode was. But really, those complaints were soon trivialized with the arrival of lunch. In addition to being visually striking, the food on this flight also had the added bonus of tasting pretty good. You do get a choice for the hot item, and in this case, I went with the chicken shawarma. This chocolate coconut thing was almost too pretty to eat. Almost. Qatar definitely did not use the time constraint on this flight as an alibi to skimp on the food. The quality of this meal on this one hour journey was the same as my previous 14 hour one. Moreover, the fact that they were able to create a menu that was as appealing in its visuals and flavors as it was in its expediency of consumption is to be lauded. Wow, that was a very pretentious way of me saying that they did a good job. Now that lunch is over, let's go check out the bathroom. When it comes to airplane bathrooms, the 777 still reigns king in this regard. Just look at the size of this sink, here's my hand for comparison. On longer flights, these drawers would be stocked with amenities such as shaving and dental kits, but on this one, just simple toiletries. This being the accessible lavatory, there is a fold-down bench, an often underappreciated convenience for everyone, especially if you intend on changing during those longer flights. And in that vein, and if you're feeling vain, so too are these full-length mirrors.
because I took this flight during the holy month of Ramadan, before we landed, each passenger in every class was given an iftar bag to take with them. Iftar being the sunset prayer that marks the breaking of the daily fast. Typically, the Quran says you don't need to fast if you're traveling more than 80 kilometers away from where you live, but for those who want to be extra pious, this is a very welcome treat, especially if you find yourself in a new place with unfamiliar surroundings. However, for me, the deserts outside of Riyadh are the furthest thing from unfamiliar. Having spent my entire childhood here, I was coming home. For returning viewers of this channel, you'll know that this is typically when I end the video. But on this occasion, there's just one more thing I want to show you. Now, this is King Khaled International Airport, and like many international hubs of a country's capital, it's to no one's surprise that it's well kept and very dignified. After all, you do want to give visitors a very good first impression of your country, especially when your kingdom has a reputation for being one of the wealthiest in the world. But I really don't think that Riyadh's airport needs that when people will see this. You might know where I'm going with this. If you don't, well, allow me to illustrate. Here's a Dreamliner. Well, at least to us plebs, it's a Dreamliner. To the Saudi royal family who owns it, tis but a minivan. Not something you necessarily want to take because it usually means sitting next to your annoying younger siblings. Because what you want is your very own private jet, and that's the Riyadh's specialty when it comes to plane spotting. Because when I say private jet, I don't mean your run-of-the-mill Gulfstream, Dassault, or Bombardier. Those are Toyota Corollas compared to what's parked here. For example, how about your very own 747-400? And this one is only one of multiple belonging to His Royal Highness Prince Al-Walid bin Talal. This thing has more square footage than my house. If you're into an European quad jet, you can also go for this tasteful A340-600. I don't know who this one belongs to, but I do know that if it were mine, I'd go for a different livery than this. I find it kind of funny that those are parked even remotely close to this Budget Airlines 320 Neo. Some may find it slightly insulting, even. Anywho, I just wanted to show you guys those planes, they've always intrigued me every time I see them and reminded me of just how unimportant I am. All right, thanks for coming along with me on this trip and tune in next time when I fly Saudiya. But for now, take care and safe travels.